The last of Newton's laws that I want to show you is Newton's third law. So this again has to do with forces and dynamics. I want to start off by just uh, maybe asking you a question. So first, before even starting off, let's look at this one. You have a train that collides with a car. The question is, which one feels the most force, the train or the car? This could be uh, any sort of situation. I mean, this doesn't just have to be a big train and a big car. It could be anything. But if we have a big train here, I don't really know how to draw a train, but it's kind of square looking and it's got lots of wheels, I guess. I'm not sure. And uh, it's got lots of other train cars on it like this. So let's say this thing here is moving you know, forward at some velocity here. This is a train, obviously, and it runs into a poor little car that's just parked here. So the car is just, uh, you know, someone maybe, hopefully they're not in the car, but um, let's say this is my little convertible car. Maybe I'm in the car. Well, that would be really bad. So my car, let's say, is just stationary, and here we go. I haven't paid attention to the uh, you know, railroad crossing. So here we go. The train comes in, and of course the uh, person right here is probably honking uh, like crazy because it's about to run into me. The question is, who feels more force? So I had to try to think about that. And while you think about that, then we're going to learn about Newton's third law. And don't worry, I promise you, we'll go over this answer. So this one right here, Newton's third law. Um, well, we could state it as something like this. For every action, there is an equal, oops, there is, an equal and opposite reaction. So an equal and opposite reaction. This is probably the sort of most important version. It's probably the most common version I've heard at least. And uh, But I want to point out a few things here. What do we mean by action and reaction? So first of all, we have um, this is actually really important to consider. What is the action-reaction pair? Because not everything is going to be the action and reaction. First of all, what do I mean by action and reaction? I mean some sort of force, it turns out. It's related at least to a force. So it turns out, as long as we know what's going on, well, action-reaction pair, let's say they first of all, they must be different objects. That's the first key thing with action and reaction pairs. And another thing is that, uh, well, they must be the same type of force. Must be the same type of force. So for example, uh, it could be, you know, gravitational, etc. So gravitational, oops, there's no I there. So gravitational. You get the idea. So whatever kind of force is acting on them, must it must be the same type of force acting on them. So that's what we mean by uh, action and reaction. Now there are lots and lots of different examples, but basically, um, well, one way to state it is this, actually. Another way to state it is this. When two, well, we're going to say bodies, but they don't have to be human bodies. We just mean two objects. So when two bodies, A and B, uh, how can I say this? Um, uh, when they interact, yeah, that's maybe a good way to say it. Uh, the force that A exerts on B, this is the key thing here. So the force that A exerts on B is equal to the force that B exerts on A. So this is maybe another way to state it here. So as long as two, a, uh, two objects are interacting and they are an action-reaction pair, in other words, different objects about the same type of force going on, well, the force that one gives to the other is the same as the other gives to the one. So that should hopefully answer this question right here then. So if a train collides with a car, which one feels the most force, the train or the car? Well, it's a trick question. Turns out both feel the same force. So 
So you might think, okay, so does that mean really that the train feels the same force uh, from the car, that the car feels from the train? Sure. Um, and that would mean then that, um, well, I mean, obviously you don't want to be in this car though, just because, I mean, although this train right here is going to feel the same force as this car did, this train has a lot more of uh, other things. Uh, things, for example, something we call inertia. So this one here has a lot more inertia than the car. And this is why, um, well, we can go into this in more detail in other videos, but it turns out that if you're in the train, you actually won't feel much. That's just because you're just, I mean, you're so massive and you're moving. Um, and that means that a, a force applied to you here won't really change your speed much. Whereas that same force applied to this one will change its speed immensely. And it turns out that that's all related. So we have something called impulse, which we were looking at before. So they're all actually related. But technically, if we look at who feels the most force, none of them do. It's actually the same force. Now, the result of what happens to each of these objects is different. This one will get totally squished, while this one might have just a few dents on the front of it. That's about it. But it's not because of the forces being different, because actually the forces are the same. It's all about other factors involved, like inertia, for example. So they both feel the same force. I was actually reminded of this because just the other day I was watching a really cheesy action movie, you know, and one of the bad guys, uh, well, sorry, there was like uh, two people who were fighting each other and uh, one person then decides to just give a headbutt to the other one. In other words, you know, the person uh, just smashes their forehead against the other person's face. And of course, the one person who got his head smashed, well, he fell down unconscious and the one person was okay. That's not realistic though, because assuming they have the same mass of head, uh, then they're both going to feel the same force. In other words, what's more realistic is if two people sort of smash each other's heads together, they're both going to, you know, fall down. So that's maybe not very good for them. So that's an example of um, Newton's third law. But there are lots of other examples. This is a great one, I think. It's because there's lots of everyday examples and maybe things you haven't actually thought of. So an example could be, I don't know if you like skateboarding or not, but uh, we could even say skateboarding or anything related to this. It could also be if you're you know, uh, skating on the ice or something like this. Let's just say that there's a wall right here and this is you standing on your skateboard. I'm not a very good artist. As you can see here, so you're standing on your skateboard here. There we go. And let's say there's a wall here, and this is the ground. So what you do then is if you want to actually, you know, let's say you're not allowed to step off of your uh, skateboard here. Well, then what would you do in order to move to the right? This sounds really weird, but a lot of you already know this, right? If you push to the left, so push left, you go to the right. I mean, it seems pretty obvious. You push to the left and then you end up going to the right. But actually, it's really weird when you really think about it. Why should I go push to the left when I end up wanting to go to the right? And that's because we end up having an action and an opposite reaction. See, two different objects, same force applied between them. So in this case, we hear this force of you know pushing here. So you could say, I push against the wall and the wall pushes against me with the exact same force. So if I push really hard against the wall, it's like the wall pushes really hard against me. So I go flying to the right. Now, I mean, that's a pretty weird thing. And yet a lot of people don't really have to think about it. They just know, oh yeah, I just push against the wall and I go to the right. But the reason behind it is really cool, I think. It's actually technically because the wall pushes back against you. Um, we can have other examples as well. What about this one? This is even more fundamental, I think. How do you jump? This is such a simple thing. How is it that you actually jump? Just think about it very carefully. So you are standing here on the ground, let's just say. There we go. And there's the ground. And you want to jump. Think very carefully about what you do, because people say, oh, I just jump up. But what, what really happens? What do you actually have to do in order to get yourself to jump? So there's your legs, and there's your you know, torso, and your arms. And there's you wanting to jump. So if you actually want to jump, what do you do? Well, normally you bend your legs first. And that doesn't really do much as far as you're jumping. But what do you do then when you're ready to jump? Well, you actually push straight down. So your legs push down. 
Now, why would that work? That's because when your legs push down, you know, the ground pushes back up. Well, not technically the ground, the earth does. So the ground pushes you up. So that means although you push down, you end up going up. And of course, the harder you push down, the obviously the more you jump. So it's proportional, you know, less push down means less high, high uh, of a jump. So this sounds really obvious. I mean, everyone knows how to jump, or at least most people do. And yet when you think deeply about it, it's really cool. I mean, you're actually acting as an action reaction pair, you and the earth. Technically, you're pushing down against the earth. Therefore, the earth pushes up against you. That's really cool, I think. Uh, we have other examples as well. How about, uh, I mean, with rockets, for example. What do they do? How does a rocket work? Well, if you're out in outer space, actually people used to think that rockets couldn't actually uh, work in outer space because there was nothing to push against, you know, because there's in outer space, there's just a vacuum. But it turns out the way uh, a rocket actually sort of can, can go, at least if it's got its little engine here, what does it do? Well, it throws out material here. Maybe I'll do this in red again. So it spits out lots of material. In this case, what it does, it has a little uh, explosion inside and it kicks out gases to the left. So gases move left. So that means then that the rocket moves to the right. Why is that? They are an action and reaction pair. So when you, you know, push lots of little gases to the left, then the rocket actually goes to the right. That's an action reaction pair. You push stuff out to the left, you go to the right. So I think this is really, really cool. There's so many examples of these kind of things happening here. Okay, so this is, uh, I mean, there's lots and lots of examples. There's tons, but I mean, this is just three of them. And actually, I think I'll just give you a fourth one just because it's kind of a neat one. Um, it turns out that action and reaction pairs, they can actually help us to predict something about uh, even, believe it or not, how we find planets around other stars, at least one of the methods. So exoplanets, it turns out. So exoplanet detection. This is just something that I know about just because I've been looking at it uh, in my own studies. So exoplanet detection, at least using the radial velocity method, sometimes called the Doppler method. What happens there is, okay, we're trying to find a planet around another star. But the problem is this star is so far away Maybe I'll draw it in uh, yellow here. So maybe I'll just color it yellow. So that's my star. And then we have a little planet going around it. So let's say this is a little planet right here going around. Dee, 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 dee. There's the planet orbiting around the star. Now the problem is though, that we are so far away from this that actually we can't we can't really see the planet. Well, it turns out actually through really clever ways we can start to actually see the planet, but in this method of detection, you don't even need to see the planet. All you do is you look at the star only. Now, the reason why you normally can't see the planet, or at least certainly not easily, is because the star is so bright and the planet is so dim compared to it. I mean, the planet either gives off no light or very little light, but the star gives off tons of light. It's like trying to look at the sun and see a tiny little firefly, you know, that's sort of you know, zipping around. You're not going to see it. The sun's way too bright. Well, that's the equivalent of what's happening here. So if we can't take a direct picture of a planet going around another star, just because they're so far away and the star is so bright compared to the planet, we don't have the resolution needed in order to sort of distinguish between the planet and the star. So what we do then is a really clever way. We say, okay, no problem. This planet and this star should form an action reaction pair, which means when the planet goes around the star, technically the star should move a little bit around the planet. So when you imagine an orbit, a lot of people imagine the star stays fixed and the planet just goes around the star. That is not correct. What actually happens is the star itself wobbles a little bit. Now the planet orbits really far, you know, has a big orbit of, uh, or a big radius of orbit. Of course, we're assuming it's a circular orbit when it's not really, it's a little bit elliptical, but still. If we look at this as the planet goes around, it actually makes the star wobble. So when the planet's over here, it turns out the star's center of gravity is actually going to be a little bit over here. So the star will actually sort of move a little bit to the left. And as the planet's, let's say, over here, then the star's going to be over here. As the planet's over here, the star's going to be a little bit over here. As the planet's over here, the star's going to be over here. In other words, it's like the star sort of wobbles a little bit too. 
So all we do is we watch the star carefully. There's someone down below in my apartment, in the apartment below, who's got a baby who's really crying and screaming. I don't know if you can hear that, but uh, sorry. Uh, I suppose the baby's not uh, very happy for whatever reason. So anyway, we watch the star carefully. We see it, well, I'm gonna say the word wobble. So we see it sort of, we see the star sort of go back and forth. So we see it wobble and uh, can uh, detect the planet that way. This is really cool. And it turns out, I mean, how do we actually see the star wobble? It turns out we can break up the star's light into a spectrum, and it turns out the spectral lines are going to shift from left to right. So if we actually take the light from the star, and we we expect to see you know, certain transitions. Let's say we've got like these different lines. If you've ever heard about this, this is uh, doing something called spectroscopy. So in the star, we have these different uh, transitions happening. So maybe you have an electron in hydrogen going from one excited state to another. And when it drops down, it emits light of a very specific wavelength. Turns out, let's say we expect it to be right here. And there's another one that we know of, maybe that's right here, maybe another one that's right here. What we do is we watch the star very carefully and we take lots and lots of these sort of spectrum pictures like this. Okay, so what, what we can do, um, we can take a look at that and look at this um, spectrum. And what we notice then is that these lines, let's say, let's say there's these three lines right here. Well, it turns out when the star, the star, if, if the planets lined up correctly with us, let's say this is, this is Earth here, way far away. Well then, if the planets, these unseen planets going around the star, it's gonna make the star basically wobble back and forth. And if a star goes back and forth, it's sometimes called the Doppler method for a reason. It's because we're going to see these lines right here. Well, all of a sudden, maybe I take a picture later on and I see that all these lines are a little bit to the left. So maybe they've all sort of, they're all just a little bit to the left. So they're all a little bit, you know, this way. And if I take a picture a little bit later, maybe the same three red lines this time are to the right. So basically it's like these little lines right here, these little blue ones, it's like they're moving from left to the right, to the left, to the right. In other words, they're sort of wobbling around this central value here. What that tells us, it turns out, is that that tells us that if it's blue shifted, in other words, towards smaller wavelengths, it's going um, towards us. And then if it's going what we call red shifted, it's going away from us. So it turns out just by looking at this spectra, uh, doing this spectrum here of a star's light, just by looking at this, if we look at it over time and we see all these lines sort of go like, whoa, to the left and to the right and to the left and to the right, and we see all of them doing it by the same amount. If we see that happening, then we can say, aha, it's likely that the star is actually going towards us, away from us, towards us, away from us, right? Because that's a piece of this thing going around in a circle. It turns out just from that, we can do a graph of you know how fast these things are actually going away from us. This is the speed and this is time. We can get the period from the type of star. We can actually figure out the mass of the planet. We can figure out how far it's orbiting. From there, we can even figure out if we think there could be life on it because we can estimate the temperature. It is so cool. So there's real sort of science fiction sounding stuff, you know, to try to say, could there be, you know, ET living on this planet? And it turns out one of the ways of detecting it is just using uh, the radial velocity method. And what happens then is it's because this planet and the star are forming an action reaction pair. As the planet goes around the star, the star technically goes around as well. The star also orbits a little bit because of the planet. Now, last thing is you might wonder, well, why, um, what happens if there's more than one planet? you know, going around. Then it gets more complicated, obviously. Then these wobbles are very complex, and then you need some pretty neat computer systems to sort of disentangle this. But in a one-planet situation, it's pretty straightforward. It'll just make the star wobble back and forth. But all that, just to show some examples of how it is that Newton's law works. Newton's third law says that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. That means you do one thing, the opposite happens. It tells you about forces, that the one force on the other is the same as the other force on the one. And it explains things like skateboarding, why you push on one end and you go that way. Or how do you jump? You push down and you go up. Or how a rocket works, you spit stuff out to one side, you go to the other side. So Newton's third law has tons, really a lot of different practical examples for us.